recognize you may be joining us from other territories throughout the province, but I am here on the uh, territory of the Coast Salish peoples, along with ASL translator Nigel Howard. Today, I have two very special guests who are joining me, Minister of State for Child Care and MLA for Burnaby Lougheed, Katrina Chen, and Dr. Trevor Corneal, medical lead with the Office of the Provincial Health Officer. The COVID-19 pandemic affects all of us as British Columbians, parents, grandparents, and community members. We know that there are a lot of questions about childcare and how parents can return to work while keeping their families safe. So I will give you a quick overview of how the next hour of our virtual town hall will go, and then we'll get straight into those questions. First, Minister of State Chen will start us off with some scintillating remarks, followed by Dr. Corneal. For those of you who have a question to ask and were unable to submit a question ahead of time, you can ask it in the comment section of the live event here on Facebook. We've received a lot of questions, so we've organized them by themes so that everyone's question is covered as much as possible. For those that come in live today, we are going to try to answer as many questions as possible. So let's jump in right now. Minister of State Chen, why don't you get us started? Thank you so much, Jeannie. And hi, everyone. This is Katrina Chen, uh, Minister of State for Child Care and MOA for Burnaby Lohi. I'm very, very thankful for all of your time to join our town hall today. And I want to give a special thanks to, of course, my colleague Jeannie, who is moderating the town hall, and also to Dr. Corneal, um, who has been putting a lot of effort into the health and safety guideline for child care centers to make sure um, centers can safely operate during the pandemic and during the recovery as well. So thank you. And of course, uh, thanks to Nigel for uh, being our scientist interpreter here today. Thank you. Um, I know um, as a mother myself with a six-year-old very active young boy, um, this has been a really challenging time for many, many parents as we're trying to make the best decision possible for our families, for our children, especially now as our econom uh, economy start to restart, um, that a lot of parents are making a tough decision about whether to return to work uh, or sending their children back to childcare or schools. And that is why our government has been, uh, from the beginning, uh, doing our very best, uh, providing temporary emergency funding to support child care centers that are open to support essential services workers that have to work. And also at the same time, supporting centers that are closed so they can come back in operation when parents or more parents are coming back to work. And also making sure parents do, uh, don't have to pay for a fee. Uh, for the spots that they're not using at this moment. The temporary emergency funding has been working well for a lot of providers and we want to continue to work with the sector and parents. And we know this is going to continue to be a stressful time as we slowly recover from the pandemic. But this pandemic really highlighted the importance of early learning and childcare and how access to early learning and care is so crucial for our young children, for our families and really for our economy. So our economy can restart um, after this pandemic. So um, I want to thank you for uh, participating in this town hall. And I know many people have a lot of questions. So I look forward to uh, hearing your questions and making sure we can continue to work with public health to ensure child care can safely operate in this province. Thank you. Thank you, Minister of State Chen. And thank you for your passion and the amazing work you've been doing in this area. And now over to Dr. Corneal. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you, MLA Sims. Uh, First, I just want to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Lebanon speaking people of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations that I'm on today. Um, I'm Dr. Trevor Corneal. I am the medical lead advisor to the COVID response uh, and work in the office of the provincial health officer with Dr. Bonnie Henry. Uh, last week, uh, as Minister Chen said, we moved into phase two of BC's restart plan. Uh, and the BC Centre of Disease Control released updated health and safety guidelines for child care settings. These guidelines were developed with and endorsed by all of those who make up the uh, Office of the Provincial Health Officer uh, and uh, Dr. Bonnie herself. Uh, and uh, our goal really is to help child care centres uh, operate with increased enrollment and support those centres that were closed to reopen uh, in a safe uh, way. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard these messages before, but they're worth always saying again, the basics are the same. Uh, regular cleaning, 
uh, washing your hands. Uh, and I think in the case of daycare and schools and, and uh, childcare settings, uh, people know this very well, it's about pick up and drop off times, which are complex at the best um, of times. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see how people stagger that uh, and find a way uh, for families and children to get the childcare they need uh, as they uh, return to work over the coming weeks. Uh, I know parents still have questions about having their uh, children return to childcare, and I'm looking forward to answering those questions. So without further ado, I'll turn it back to you, Emily Sims. Thank you, Dr. Corneille, and uh, your whole team for the amazing work you have been doing. And now I will begin with the questions we have already received from people in communities throughout our province, starting with, and this question is for Minister Chen, uh, and this question comes from uh, Bubin from Surrey. How will I ever be comfortable in sending my child back to childcare? How will I ever regain that kind of trust? Please help me. What should a parent do on her part? And what should we look for in a facility to be able to send my child? Thank you so much for that question. And I, as a parent myself, I ask those questions often as well about, you know, sending my son back to his kindergarten class and also uh, looking at what's the best solution for our family. And every family has different situations and needs. Um, so I'm very thankful that we've been working very closely with public health. And again, we have the support of Dr. Cornel here today um, to make sure childcare and schools can safely operate. And um, uh, for myself, I am sending my son back to kindergarten next week. Um, I'm actually kind of excited about that because I've seen the social emotional impact on him. You know, we only have one child and the inability for him to interact with other kids has made a huge impact on him uh, during this pandemic. And I look forward to sending him back to school so he can interact with other kids and continue with his learning. But of course, every family is different and there are so many different families with different situations. Some may have an elderly parent at home that they may be worried about a health and safety risks. Uh, risk. So um, we respect parents uh, for those decisions. And that is why government is providing funding to support providers that are open and also closed. And as a parent, I would recommend all the other parents to um, look at the public health guidelines. Um, they provide really good advice about how to prepare our children back to school and to childcare settings. Um, those guidelines can help providers and early childhood educators to make sure childcare centers can safely operate as well. Thank you. Uh, my next question is uh, from Jenny from North Vancouver. And this question I'm going to direct to Dr. Corneal. Specifically, what symptoms warrant keeping a child at home and what symptoms warrant a staff member staying at home? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really great question. Uh, and I think that's a question that we have been uh, grappling with is, is what's a simple way or a straightforward way of, um, of uh, articulating uh, what to do. COVID is an interesting uh, um, disease um, caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, and it has a lot of symptoms. It can present in all sorts of ways. We know it presents with respiratory symptoms, uh, with gastrointestinal symptoms, with skin symptoms, uh, with... Um, uh, coughs and uh, runny noses, things that are, are pretty run-of-the-mill uh, for, for children. Uh, so what we've decided is the best approach is what we're calling the daily health check, uh, which is um, ask the question, uh, if you're a staff member, am I feeling well today or am I not feeling well? And if you're not feeling well, you should stay home and uh, either consult with your doctor or nurse practitioner uh, or um, check the BC Thrive app, and it will help navigate you through some of those questions. We also have the 811 number, uh, which uh, has people at the other end of the phone uh, who can answer questions and help guide you. Uh, the same for children. If you're a parent, ask the question, is my child well today or is my child sick today? Uh, and if they're sick, try and get to the bottom of what that is. Uh, your primary care provider or 811 will help you sort through uh, whether it's an allergy or whether it might be COVID, uh, whether it's uh, a rash caused by a different virus. Uh, that's something that 
that, that we're here in the back end to, to help you as a parent uh, and help child care operators uh, manage as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, I have another question, and uh, Dr. Corneal, don't go away. This one is for you as well. <laughs> and this one is from Jen from Victoria. You keep saying that uh, less than 1% of children have contracted the virus. However, schools and many daycares closed for the last 10 weeks, so there wouldn't be much possibility for spreading between children. How can you be so sure that daycares opening to full capacity is a good idea? Why no concerns over inflammatory conditions in children? Uh, another great question. Uh, we've been reading the research very closely uh, from other countries, countries that have uh, had um, COVID uh, earlier than us, uh, and looked at what their numbers are. Uh, the most recent uh, study that we were um, looking at just the other day was out of Iceland, where they actually looked at a group of people that included children to see uh, how many cases there were. And it was in the range that uh, we were expecting uh, between um, uh, four and six percent. Uh, we've been fortunate in BC that we have been under one percent uh, in, in children, uh, which is remarkable. Uh, and uh, I think our approach moving forward uh, is to be careful, to reopen in a careful way uh, and to be ready should there be a case, uh, um, how to manage that case and how to manage that child and how to support that family uh, out the other end. So we have um, good literature that we draw on. We have our own numbers in the province uh, and recommendations that we make now, we can adjust uh, as this pandemic evolves. Thank you. Uh Dr. Corneal, my next question, it's not really my question, but one I'm going to read out is for Minister Chen, and it's from Teresa from Nelson. Will you continue the TEF funding through this restart up process? I am very concerned about the extra cleaning and where the funds are going to come to pay for all those extra hours. So at this moment, uh, the temporary emergency funding that the province has been providing to childcare providers, whether they're closed or open, uh, remain in place. And uh, we know that many providers will come back uh, to resume and increase their capacity. We're going to definitely monitor the situation, work with providers and look at the needs. And uh, we'll definitely provide more updates once we have that available. And we know it is important, uh, like I mentioned earlier, that childcare is so crucial for BC's restart plan, for our parents, for our children and for our economy. So we do look forward to working with everybody during this process and the temporary emergency funding remains in place at this moment. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister Chen. The next question is for Dr. Corneal again. And this is Morgan from Saanich. And Morgan asks, my double digit aid child has been an essential worker childcare. She has kids and adults touching her there and it promotes anxiety. What do essential workers do if school is not safe and they have no childcare? I really appreciate that question uh, because I know how stressful this has been uh, for uh, families of uh, essential workers, uh, people who um, have been required uh, to keep our uh, healthcare system going, uh, to keep some of our um, um, uh, industries going, uh, and of course, uh, daycare, childcare, and schools have been a part of that. Uh, what I can do is reassure you uh, that with the measures that we put in place from a public health perspective, which is um, very accessible testing, uh, good contact tracing, and supports around those people who we learn are positive, that we're able to remove a significant amount of risk from that setting. Uh, the next um, uh, question one should ask is, um, is the place where my child is going or where my uh, family member is working, uh, do they have the rules in place uh, and, and, a, and a way for children uh, to um, stay home uh, if they're sick? And for staff, um, do they have the mechanisms in place uh, for them to stay home? when they're sick. I think everyone needs to have a plan out the other end uh, should they get sick. Uh, if everyone stays home when they're sick, that will get us even further uh, to a place where if we do all of our good hand hygiene, all of the environmental cleaning, 
uh, we'll be in a very uh, safe place for both uh, our children and for our staff. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for you as well, Dr. Cornell, and it's from Sarah in Delta, next door neighbor here. Are COVID symptoms the same in children and adults? And how would I know whether my preschool age child has COVID-19 or just the regular cold or flu? Mm -hmm. Another great question. Uh, what we do know, uh, and this is a good thing, is that children are not impacted in the same way adults are. Not only is the infection rate much lower, uh, but the symptoms are much milder. So it is going to be difficult to tease uh, that apart. Uh, the symptoms uh, are common symptoms that every child uh, has or gets. Uh, what's interesting I've noticed amongst my family uh, is there, are, uh, there aren't a lot of colds and bugs going around uh, in my circle of friends and in my bubbles. And that's because everyone's been in their bubbles. So I think um, as we go back out into the world and, and engage uh, in childcare and in school, um, there will be um, more opportunity for mixing. But I think if we are careful um, and, and watch our children uh, and ensure that they um, are well and have a plan if they're not, uh, then that will get us a long way to ensuring uh, that um, we keep these very important spaces safe. Uh, I will add one more time, the best thing you can do uh, if you think your child may have a symptom is use the BC Thrive app and call your family doctor or your family nurse practitioner or 811 and they will help you navigate through the system and sort out whether it is or is not uh, COVID. And chances are, uh, it, it won't be COVID. Uh, so, so that should be reassuring to people. I just want to say that's a great app. We used it for my granddaughter when she had a really bad cold and um, it really did provide a lot of reassurance. Okay. So, and very, very easy to navigate, which uh, is wonderful. So the next question is for Minister Chen. And this question comes from Todd uh, from South Surrey. If daycares are shut down again in the event of a second wave, Will there be any relief provided for those who operate or attend a non-licensed daycare facility? Thank you so much for the question, Todd. And um, I cannot speak to uh, what's going to happen in the fall. Maybe Dr. Cornell can help out uh, to talk a little bit about the, the second wave. Um, but in terms of childcare, um, our government is committed, as we have been, to support childcare providers um, through different measures. And currently, of course, we have the temporary emergency funding for licensed providers. But for non-licensed providers, they can also continue to get support. The license not require providers uh, to get support from their local childcare resource referral center who have uh, done a really good job um, helping to match essential services workers to child care services available in the community. Our affordable child care benefit uh, remains available for a lot of families and also uh, we have programs such as the startup funding program to help uh, non-licensed child care providers to become licensed. So those programs continue to remain in place. They continue to be really popular. A lot of providers have been using those programs. And if um, your provider or the family has a specific question about a specific situation, we would totally encourage you to connect with your local child care resource referral center for more information or send us an email. Uh, my email is uh, cc.minister at gov.bc.ca, and we are, will definitely look into individual uh, scenarios and situations to try to provide support. Thank you, Minister. So the next question is for Dr. Cornell, and it's from uh, Jessica uh, from Vancouver. We have been sending my kid to daycare center during this COVID-19 pandemic. I was concerned about daycare staff not wearing PPEs, such as face masks. We would like to know whether staff and children should wear face masks for their protection as well as for the protection of others. Uh, another uh, great question. Uh, uh, thanks, Jessica. Uh, in controlled settings like daycare, and I, and I know they, they may be a bit chaotic, but they're actually quite controlled. There's a lot of, of rules that daycare operators, child care operators have to follow. Uh, there are licensing officers that help them uh, with their procedures. Uh, and um, we, um, we use uh, that set of rules to ensure uh, that we have a safe place. Once we have all of those um, rules in place, once we have people staying home 
when they're sick. Once we have a good cleaning in place, uh, we actually know that uh, PPE is not uh, very effective. So we don't recommend uh, that um, the child care providers uh, wear uh, non-medical masks in that setting, um, though we certainly aren't going to keep people from wearing them. And we certainly don't recommend children uh, wear a mask. They actually touch their face far more often uh, and uh, it, it causes more of a problem than it does um, um, any, any good. So uh, the answer is you can be reassured uh, that uh, personal protective equipment will be used when it is appropriate and there is a set of circumstances. It's usually gloves uh, and sometimes an apron uh, where it's appropriate to be using that um, in a daycare on a regular basis. So it's back to normal. Thank you, uh, Dr. Corneal. The next question is for you, so don't go away. This one is from Cindy from Nanaimo. It appears clear that schools will have physical distancing requirements, but what about preschool daycares and after-school care programs that focus on play? Mm -hmm. uh, we've really um, worked hard to come up with a, a way of articulating this that is helpful for uh, children, uh, but also uh, for staff. Uh, and then, of course, for parents. So we absolutely recommend physical distancing uh, for adults. Uh, we know that that is a very important uh, way of uh, preventing transmission. It's one of our, our, our key measures. Uh, for young adults, um, we're, we know that the, the, the risk is lower that they get infected uh, and they're less likely to transmit. Uh, so we're telling young adults uh, that they should um, try and physical distance, uh, but but we are not uh, going to to, to police um, young adults as as they will do what young adults do. Children, on the other hand, um, find physical distancing quite difficult. Uh, so what we've chosen to do, and it's a slightly different message than you're hearing from other places, is have children avoid physical contact. So the touching. Uh, and I, I've already heard that even that is tough for kids, and that's okay because the infection rate is so low. Uh, it, we, we really um, think the, the, the risk to any child at that age um, is, 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 is not significant in that setting. Um, but we think that's a way of, of helping small children understand uh, some of the things that they've seen their, their adults and their parents do. Uh, thank you. The next question is for you again, um, Dr. Corneal. We're keeping you busy here today. And the last question um, that I'm going to ask for now is, uh, well, it's not the last question. It's um, Beth from Victoria. I'm sorry, this is for uh, Dr. Chen. Uh, and it's question uh, 24. Our daycare is reopening but with strict measures in place, such as sending a child with a runny nose or a cough home for over a week, we cannot return to work with such unpredictable care. What is the province doing to address the lack of reliable care for the duration of the pandemic? We definitely understand this is a stressful time. Um, and I want to echo what Dr. Cornio has said. Uh, it is hard uh, for children to keep social distancing. I had this discussion with my six years old and he said, mommy, it's so hard for me not to uh, play with my friends and not being able to touch them. So we've been practicing instead of fist bump, we uh, do a uh, foot bump, <laughs> trying to find creative ways to uh, keep our kids engaged, but keep that distance. Um, but it is a stressful time for parents to worry about the health and safety of their children, especially if they do have a cold and unable to go to childcare. And that is why I'm, I'm really proud that Premier John Horgan has been advocating really hard um, to work with the federal government on the national paid sick leave. And I think it will be an important step um, as we are recovering from this pandemic and looking at uh, what is so important for workers to be able to uh, look after their family and needs, especially if, if they are, you know, having a cold symptom and not being able to go to work or send their kids to childcare. Um, I think the pay sick leave program, and I look forward to hearing more details from the federal government, would really support that need. But at the same time, we're very thankful in BC that we have public health professionals uh, who have been working closely with us to update guidelines, to support childcare providers, to operate their centers safely and also to support parents. So I would encourage parents to have good conversations with your child care providers to talk about the situation that's ever changing uh, every day and your family's unique needs and the child care providers um, unique situation as well. Uh, the child
childcare uh, said uh, childcare sector in BC is very diverse. We have so many different ways of running a childcare, from smaller centers, family based, to large group centers. Um, we want to make sure we all work together to look at those individual situations and make sure that we continue to support childcare to operate safely and what's the best for parents and best for providers and the hardworking early childhood educators who are working on the front line to keep them safe and healthy as well. Thank you, uh, Minister Chen. The next question I have is uh, for uh, Dr. Cornell, and this is from Valerie, and it's just coming in. My concern is that my kids could go potentially infect their grandparents or people around them. I hear this question all the time, Dr. Cornell. What's the risk of that? Well, we know, that, again, the risk of children getting infected is much lower. Uh, in fact, I think we only have uh, six or seven uh, children in the whole province uh, who are happily recovering very well uh, with very mild symptoms. Uh, so first of all, uh, um, uh, we can reassure you that we're watching the numbers carefully. Second, uh, if there is a positive case, uh, we will know about it because everyone's going to get tested uh, and has been getting tested. Uh, and uh, then we have a nurse uh, follow up uh, and actually ensure that that family has everything in place uh, that they need to support that child staying at home. Uh, should we uh, deal with a case uh, that um, spreads to another child, we'll look after that what's called a cluster and manage that uh, as we always do in public health. We do this for other viruses as well, norovirus, um, uh, other things like uh, um, parvovirus. There's all sorts of bugs out there that childcare operators are actually quite um, uh, good uh, at, um, at managing. Uh, so um, I think uh, the risk is very low that you're going to uh, pass it on to anyone if you don't have it. Uh, that's the goal. Um, the, the risk of passing it on to someone older um, is also unlikely because children don't have very many symptoms. Their symptoms are often mild, uh, and in some cases it's asymptomatic. Although there is evidence of some asymptomatic spread, um, it's very small. Uh, so it really is about symptoms. When people have symptoms, they pass it on to others. So if your child uh, is ill or if they have a runny nose and you haven't sorted out what it is yet, it's probably best that they don't go and visit uh, their grandparents. Uh, but if they're well and you know what well is, as a parent, you, you're, we know that you, you're the best people to tell when your child is well and when they're not. Uh, and uh, you'll know that, that it's safe and, and your child can go ahead uh, and visit their family. But we talk about this a lot, Dr. Henry and I. Uh, we, we need to do this carefully. So I think this is going to be, uh, I'm thinking of it as an exploratory few weeks uh, as everyone tries to figure out how to make all of this work. And people aren't going to get it perfect, and that's okay because uh, our numbers are so low in D.C. This is the perfect time to actually get out and, try and practice and try this out. I know that Minister Chen spoke about the potential of a second wave. But that is possible. Um, it will probably come along uh, with our annual influenza. Uh, uh, it's a pandemic as well. People just don't talk about it. Uh, and there will be lots of other viruses that travel around. Um, what we have in place, we've learned a lot about, uh, about how to keep track and, and how to sort things out in the back end. So we're ready for uh, um, early signaling if the cases start to increase uh, and implementing measures uh, at a population level or at a local level or even in an individual child care center or school uh, to help support them should there be a case or a cluster. And, and hopefully uh, we uh, will be able to manage uh, our way through the fall without too much, too much trouble. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Minister Chen. Uh, and this question is from Michelle, who's asking, I've been off, so I took kids out of daycare and my spots have been held by the care provider at no cost to me. If I continue to stay home instead of returning to work, will my spots continue to be held? Or what are the guidelines around that? Thanks so much for the question, Michelle. Um, 
The province has been providing temporary emergency funding to support uh, spaces that are open and also closed. But if your parent, whether if your center is closed or open, if your parents, like Michelle's case, are not uh, using the childcare spot for your children because you may not be working at this moment, um, that you don't have to pay for a fee to hold the spot as long as the temporary emergency funding is in place. So as I mentioned that the temporary emergency funding uh, remains in place at this moment, we're going to continue to monitor the situation and the increased um, capacity that providers um, who are deciding to return to their more regular capacity in the coming weeks. Um, I know it's slow. I'm hearing some centers want to wait for a bit or some centers are slowly increasing a few kits uh, every week. So uh, it's really up to providers and parents to work together to decide what's the best for their childcare settings. But as long as the temporary emergency funding is in place, parents don't have to pay uh, for a fee to hold the spot. And currently we are supporting over 110,000 uh, spaces uh, to, that are uh, utilizing the temporary emergency funding. Thank you. And uh, the next question I have is from Jacqueline and it's for Dr. Cornell. Other than the childcare requirements set up by uh, in the BC Restart Plan, are childcare centres required to develop their own safety measures on top of what is outlined in the Restart Plan? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, so we've put out uh, a Restart Plan. Uh, we've also put out guidelines uh, for childcare centres at uh, uh, the BC Centre for Disease Control uh, website. Uh, and uh, every uh, child care operator actually has to have a plan uh, and that plan has to be approved by a licensing officer. That's their daily, how do we actually operate our daycare? And there's a lot of infection control and communicable disease prevention uh, already in place in those plans. So they've already been reviewed once. Uh, then uh, we have asked uh, all uh, operators of a business, which includes daycares, uh, to actually provide uh, a workplace health and safety plan, a COVID plan, uh, uh, for their employees and for that plan to be posted so people can actually see uh, whether it's safe to go to work and, and what are the different things that a particular business or operator has put in place uh, to uh, ensure the safety of the um, uh, employers. So we have the kids looked after, uh, and we have the daycare providers or the early childhood educators looked after. Uh, and I think that will serve us well moving forward. Thank you. And I have a question for Minister Chan, and it's from Brianne. What can families do if their daycare centre has decided not to welcome back families or expand their numbers beyond the limited capacity during the first phase of the pandemic and they have not provided a restart plan for the near future. This leaves families without care and unable to secure new jobs or return to a job if they have one. That's a really good question. And um, I think it's been a tough time for a lot of people, for parents and for childcare providers and for early childhood educators as well. We've heard a lot of story across the province. And of course, every childcare setting uh, can be different. There are some small uh, operators, family care providers or large centers. And I've heard, for example, um, some family providers who are not comfortable reopening because they may have a senior who is residing at the same place. Um, there's so many different scenarios. And that is why government is providing the temporary emergency funding to support both closed and open providers. But of course, it's such a struggle for parents who are unable to return to work due to lack of childcare services. And we do want to uh, assure providers and working with public health uh, professionals like Dr. Cornell that um, childcare can safely reopen. Um, it's time to look at a reopening plan or a restart plan to think about your capacity. Um, they can safely operate under the best practices and the guidelines that's provided by uh, our public health. And for parents who are struggling to find services if that service their original provider is not available we encourage you to use our online matching uh, process um, at first it was open to essential services workers in the beginning but now we've opened it up to all parents so you can go to uh, www.gov.bc.ca slash child care covid uh, hyphen 19 
response. Or I know that's very long. <laughs> or you Google Child Care BC uh, and Child Care uh, COVID-19 response plan. I think a website will come up from the gov.bc.ca site. And then there is a matching service available for parents. You can uh, put in your information um, to uh, have the local Child Care Resource Referral Center looking at local providers that may be available to find you a spot. And, and from what I've heard from the sector is that uh, quite a few providers are reopening and uh, restarting their capacity. There are spots available in many communities, but of course we'll monitor the situation very carefully, but I would encourage parents to use that online service to get a matched uh, service and program near your home or your workplace. Okay, thank you. And our next question comes to us from Roxanne, and this is for Dr. Cornell. Can children attend multiple childcare programs going from daycare to preschool as an example? The short answer to that question is yes. Uh, there is no public health reason to, at this time, prevent children from being in different uh, child care uh, centers or in uh, daycares or preschools. Uh, same for school. Uh, we um, know that people will be moving between some of these different uh, um, settings. Um, I do think that uh, within a setting, uh, we need to be careful. We need to make sure that it's the same children at a site working uh, with uh, similar or, or one or two um, uh, uh, early childhood educators each day. Uh, we're asking the same at schools uh, and the same will apply for some of the preschools. Um, what that does overall is it limits the number of people. Um, I know it still feels or sounds like quite a big bubble, uh, but if we each of these different places follows that, that guidance, the bubble will be much smaller than the bubble that people are used to um, in the past, uh, but bigger than, than the one that we've gotten comfortable with uh, over the last few months. Okay, thank you for that answer. And our next question is for you as well, Dr. Cornell. And this one is from Grace, who asks, what will happen when more and more kids return to childcare centers? For example, all 25 kids want to return at the same time. How will childcare centers be able to ensure social distancing with things like shared cubbies, shared activities, and more germs from each family that comes back? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the guidelines, we've, we've tried to set them up in a way uh, that uh, will uh, help keep physical contact between children, uh, will keep children from um, passing around uh, one common uh, toy that isn't washed, uh, keep them together in smaller groups when we do activities. Uh, and this is going to be uh, a big change. Um, we are going to watch for viruses uh, and bacteria very carefully. Uh, you need to know that uh, the operators are very experienced and uh, they, uh, they know what things to look for. You as a parent are very experienced, you know what to look for. Uh, and um, uh, if we do our job well, uh, we, we check with our healthcare providers, we get testing done where it's relevant, we'll be able to track where the viruses are, uh, when they're increasing, which virus is on the, is on the rise, uh, and then manage it the best we can. And of course, we'll be very uh, careful to watch the, the, the COVID-19 uh, numbers uh, and adjust things. We can adjust our guidelines as we go. Uh, um, and when we think of it in a uh, sort of a put on the brakes, put on the accelerator, we want to be in, in the driver's seat. We're in control. Um, we w wasn't that way three months ago, but I think we're in a good position now to, to be in control and, and with all of the supports that have been put in place uh, by government uh, and all of the work that everyone has done out there, both parents and operators, uh, I know we're, we're in a good position to, 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 to take control of, of what um, certainly has felt like something very uncontrollable. So uh, it'll be a, an interesting few weeks, as I said, and this is, this is the opportunity for everyone to, to get a sense of what it feels like to have some control over this virus and, and to get ahead of it. 
Thank you, Dr. Cornell. And the next question comes from Holly. And Holly, uh, I'm going to direct this question to Minister Chan. What's being done to protect and provide support for childcare workers? Thanks for that very important question, Holly. Um, early childhood educators have been, I would call them the workforce behind a workforce. Without early childhood educators and providers supporting the parent needs for childcare, we don't have a workforce that can restart our economy and our province. So I, I want to take this opportunity to thank all the ch early childhood educators and professionals for your dedication, your hard work. And during this very difficult time, a lot of you have really stepped up um, to support our community, continue to, to run and operate. Um, there are support for early childhood educators, of course, and we've actually started that plan, uh, our Child Care BC plan about two years ago, looking at how do we support the sector, build a, an affordable, um, quality and inclusive early learning and care system. But this pandemic really uh, created a huge impact on the sector. And, and I cannot tell you the amount of stories that I've heard from the past two months. And, and we are working every day to look at what can we do as a government to support the sector. So for example, through our temporary emergency funding that um, as enrollment continues to increase, uh, we are expecting providers may receive a surplus uh, from that funding for their operating fund um, that they cannot use for profit. So in our funding guideline for the temporary emergency fund, we have encouraged providers to look at um, using that extra surplus to give it to their staff, to support their staff, uh, to make sure their staff can continue continue that very important work. And we know some child care centers have already been starting doing that and using the surplus to support their staff. Um, the public health guideline definitely supports our early childhood educators to make sure they remain safe and being protected. And I know um, WorkSafe BC has also released guidelines to support workers to continue to safely work in the environment. Um, and uh, we also want to encourage all the early childhood educators to utilize all the other provincial and federal funding that's available um, to support workers in general, that uh, provincially there's the $1,000 uh, support that if you your work has been impacted during COVID, we encourage you to utilize that. There's other programs uh, also to support your hydro bills, your rent, um, contact your local MLA for more information on the list of all the services available. Um, and then the same time, of course, um, you know, during COVID, we had a second dollar an hour wage enhancement that was already scheduled um, and added to early childhood educators um, wage enhancement programs. So early childhood educators are getting $2 an hour wage enhancement. And we'll continue to look at measures of how do we support early childhood educators, including working with local uh, child care resource referral centers who also being on the front line, support a lot of our local providers and again uh, thank you uh, for being the workforce behind the workforce uh, we'll continue to work together as we make our early childhood education sector stronger um, after this pandemic uh, we have to continue to work together thank you uh, don't go away minister chen because the next question is for you as well and it's from zoe who asks please outline the additional funding daycares are being provided with in order to meet health and safety guidelines. So that would be, I think, our temporary emergency uh, funding. Um, uh, that, that, I think that's the question that's being asked. Um, so as I mentioned, the temporary emergency funding support um, providers who are closed uh, or open to maintain their operation or to support them to come back um, in operation when they need to. Um, we've so far provided, um, I think, close to $100 million. Um, it's about 45 to $50 million per month. So it is a significant investment from the government to support the sector. Um, at the same time, uh, we continue to support um, programs that are open. Uh, parents can access the affordable child care benefit, the fee reduction program that reduce parent fees, um, and amount all the other support that's available. Um, we actually are just looking at some of the new numbers coming in. We have providers who are interested and continue to want to create spaces. Um, we have a comprehensive child care plan, and we've started that about two, three years ago through our Child Care BC plan to look at affordability, quality, and accessibility. And we will continue that work, and we'll continue to work with providers to look at every measure possible um, to ensure we can build a path to um, a system that will be available for all families in BC. Thank you. And our next question is for Dr. Cornell, and it's one I hear often as an MLA as well. And this is one from Melinda who's asking, if my kids are going to daycare, can I still expand my bubble to one other household or 
to healthy grandparents. Yeah, thanks, Melinda. Uh, this uh, is is a is a question that gets asked in my family uh, quite a bit as well. Uh, the answer is uh, yes. Uh, we are, in a sense, breaking down the bubble a little bit so that people can get back to work, uh, and uh, we can do that uh, because we're not seeing very many new cases uh, and we have things in place, uh, should we get more cases? Um, so uh, I think it's reasonable for people uh, to, to, to expand their bubble or, or extend their bubble, but to do it slowly and carefully. That's what will help us in the back end as we uh, watch uh, uh, the numbers and, and see what happens. Um, my, uh, my nephew, uh, um, uh, has been uh, um, staying at home with uh, my sister, uh, who is a teacher, uh, and everyone is going back to work now. So my my parents, his grandparents, are uh, trying to um, establish what the right thing to do is. When can he go and visit? Uh, and and the answer is um, if he's well, uh, if uh, uh, he's looked after in a in a, um, a school setting or in a childcare setting that, that my sister feels comfortable with uh, and feels is safe, uh, then the family is going to have a conversation. Uh, and that will actually be a decision that the grandparents will make. Uh, the grandparents are in a position where they actually um, know about the risks. I know lots of grandparents have been watching these town halls very closely like everyone else uh, because they are there to support you as family members. Uh, so um, I actually don't give a medical opinion. I actually step back and say, it's not my, my decision to make. Uh, so uh, my mom and dad, uh, they have made the decision uh, that they feel that they can um, um, invite uh, my nephew into their bubble. And I, and I think that that's going to work uh, very well. And yes, he's going to be going back to school next week, uh, like everyone else. Uh, and, and I think, I think, I feel reassured with everything in the back end. Uh, I'm not concerned, uh, but more importantly is uh, my sister uh, and my nephew uh, and my parents, uh, they all feel very reassured as well. Thank you for that answer. And I think that reiterates what we hear over and over again, that yes, all the back end work has been done, but at the end of the day, it's families that will have to make that determination. And I chickened out as well. I told my granddaughter she had to do her own assessment and uh, make her own decision as well. So, Dr. Corneal, I have a question for you from Ghazala, who asks, what are the precautions we can take at home when the child returns from daycare? Mm -hmm. um, something that we want all children to be doing uh, when uh, they're at daycare is practicing good hand hygiene uh, like they have been practicing for the last 12 weeks. Uh, and then when they come back from uh, daycare, they should be practicing good hand hygiene. Uh, I think if anyone comes home uh, and is covered in dirt uh, and uh, is uh, coming in for the night, it's always a good idea to have that bath or that that shower and clean them up. Uh, and uh, that will, uh, because of all of the good things we do, the things we know about the virus, that will get rid of any virus if there is any. And, and I'm not actually worried about the COVID virus. I'm worried about all the other viruses uh, that the kids can pick up. Uh, and then of course, uh, when it's time for dinner, they can wash their hands. Uh, and if they play in between, uh, they should do the same. So nothing special, nothing different, uh, but I think, um, um, uh, people just need to be more careful about doing the right thing, about practicing good hygiene uh, um, when people come home uh, and, and before uh, they, uh, uh, they eat and before they engage as a family. Thank you. And Minister Chen, you have an interesting question here. What happens to the spots that are being used by essential service workers, but now the child that held that spot before wants to take the same spot back. 
That's actually a really important question. Um, we So we've been working with providers who are getting our temporary emergency funding and also through the matching services to prioritize spaces for essential services workers who are on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we all need to work together on this. So if your provider continues to receive the temporary emergency funding, we will ask them to continue to prioritize those spaces in the meantime. But every child care center may be different and may be unique and they may not be reaching their full capacity at this moment. So we would encourage um, the parents to talk to your early child, uh, sorry, your child care provider to see what would be the best solution possible while they continue to prioritize spaces for essential services workers. If uh, in a situation that they don't have a spot um, for the families that originally were at the child care center, that we would also encourage parents to use our online matching system that's now open to all parents um, through the hard work of our uh, local child care resource referral center staff, that um, all parents can use the online system. And again, if you search uh, child care COVID-19 response and go to the gov.bc.ca website, the government website, uh, you'll find the online matching service um, so provide, uh, parents who um, may be worried about losing their spot can also use that service to find another spot available or work with a local child care resource referral center and the providers together to find the best solution among the families. We know this is an interesting time. It is a transition. Um, we, we are not hearing a lot of providers coming back to the full capacity right away. So we are hoping that parents will continue to have the access, whether if you're an essential services worker or not. However, that being said, um, we'll monitor the situation very closely to make sure there's no competition between families families. Uh, we'll work with our local child care resource referral center and we also count on providers and parents to make the best decision possible. But at the same time, because we are not over this pandemic yet, it is important that we all support each other and all work together to support our frontline workers and essential services workers who are keeping our community running. So we uh, thank all the parents for your understanding in this moment. Thank you. Uh, the next question I have here is for Dr. Corneal and it's from Da. And the question is, should sensory tactile activities be avoided, such as play with water, play with sand and Play-Doh? Interesting question. I get asked this a lot, actually. Um, there, we want to try and avoid having a lot of different children playing with the same uh, toy or the same tactile uh, type of uh, object. Uh, now we know that kids actually learn better when they are using uh, their their physical senses and their tactile senses. Uh, we also know that there are some children who need that tactile sense uh, to, to to do well and to actually learn. Uh, and so it's important that we we think this through on a. Um, a facility or operator by operator or center by center basis. Uh, we, um, you know, Play-Doh, I think, is an example of something that probably is not necessary. Um, uh, it, 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 we know that it could be a, f a fomite or something that the virus could travel on, whereas sand and water we're not so concerned about. Uh, so, you know, I think that there are some good judgment calls that can be made. Uh, the nice thing is, is that operators do have resources available to them. Uh, there are licensing officers who do, uh, like the operators, a fantastic job. No one knows about them. They're in the background making sure and working with your operators uh, to ensure that they're doing things a safe way and the right way. And they've been fully briefed on these guidelines. And, and they'll help each center make those tough decisions about uh, what toys they should keep and what toys they might want to put away or what toys they can clean frequently uh, over the course of the day uh, and, and make it available uh, to, to more than one child. Thank you. And um, I have a question uh, now for Minister Chen, and it's from Samantha. And it's one I know that keeps uh, the minister and uh, Minister Conroy busy 24-7. And that is, uh, Samantha asks, I am wondering what steps forward will be made to acknowledge the extreme need to accelerate universal childcare and a living wage for educators? Can you please be more specific on what those measures will be? I think I'm going to use up all the time <laughs> for this talk. <laughs> There's a lot being done. Uh, and I, I, I cannot thank Samantha enough for this very important question. 
Uh, we've started the work um, in 2017 and then put together the Child Care BC plan in 2018. And I think this pandemic really highlighted the importance of child care. I, I think the when we started this work, we've been come, trying to convince people that child care is so important. And now, for example, today I got an email from our local Burnaby Board of Trade saying that child care is one of their top priority. I, I was so happy to see that, you know, a lot of business communities are stepping forward to say how child care is so important for families, for our children, and for our economy. And the pandemic really highlighted that. So we have put together, I think, over three dozens of initiatives in a very short period of time during the past two, three years to support the affordability, quality, and accessibility of, of child care services for BC families as a, a start to pave a way to a universal, inclusive early learning system. And early childhood educators, I'm thankful to, uh, that Samantha asked about the living wage question have been really uh, working uh, with, you know, very challenging work um, and also low pay and not being recognized enough in the past. And, and I cannot thank them enough with all the work they've done um, for years and years. Um, so that's why government has put together the wage enhancement program. We have over a dozen initiatives that's dedicated to support the sector through bursary programs, through training, through education, and looking at continuing support to build a network of early childhood educators. Uh, we have a new pedagogies program that was just rolled out. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Um, so what happens now after the pandemic is we are really reviewing our four to seven year plan. We've done the first three years of plan. I, I think um, people can definitely look up our child care BC plan to look at the measures, but we need to review that again because of the pandemic and showed us the challenges that the sector is facing. So we will be looking at how do we further support early childhood educators? How do we further support the sector? How do we create spaces that can become community and public assets um, that will remain there uh, to support families and children during very difficult time and also to support affordability? And the wage and compensation for early childhood educator is definitely one of our top priority. I don't have any further details at this moment other than our First three year plan that's ready and uh, one another dollar that's added to the wage enhancement just in April. But I can assure Samantha and all the early childhood educators that we know without early childhood educators, we cannot build a better system. So you are our top priority. We're going to continue to work with you. I've got a lot of feedback from great organizations like Early Childhood Educators BC, uh, who's given us a lot of good input and also important uh, feedback about what the sector is feeling. And we want to continue to work with you all to make sure we can support the sector so the sector can support uh, the needs of parents. So. Thanks for that very important question. And if Samantha, you have any uh, feedback, um, please do email us. Um, if you're early childhood educator or parents, uh, send us an email at cc.minister at gov.bc.ca. We're more than happy to learn from you and as we review our plan after the pandemic. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a wonderful question from Samantha that uh, really uh, sums up the hard work that's being done in this area. And, uh, I want to say that was a lot of ground to cover in a very, very short time. And it's hard to believe that our hour together is uh, almost over. But before we leave, I do want to say a huge thank you to Minister of State um, Chen and Dr. Cornel for taking the time to answer questions from people all over the province, both that were submitted ahead of time and many that we took uh, that uh, were on Facebook Live. And thank you to each and every one of you uh, who submitted a question today and to all of you who joined us for this virtual town hall to discuss one of my favorite topics, and that is childcare. Thank you so much.